Welcome. My name is Allison Francis, and I'm the online pastor at College Wesleyan Church. We're so glad you're responding to God's invitation to worship this morning by joining us online. In this time, we fold our own conversations with God in our homes, our neighborhoods, and workplaces into this community's conversation with God. So in a very real way, something would be missing if you weren't here. Your experiences, time in prayer, your engagement with scripture, they all add dimension to the way our church has dialogue with God. It may seem like you're alone as you attend online, watching or listening on your devices. It certainly feels more convenient and comfortable this way. But even as you watch online, this worship service is meant to be done with others. Throughout the live service, the online host pastor will send links to the bulletin, our giving webpage, and other ways you can participate in acts of worship. So we invite you to use the chat feature during the live stream to engage with other believers and the online host pastor as you worship together. Whether this is your first time joining us, you attend online regularly, or you're watching at a different time than the live stream, we invite you to fill out our online connect card. This helps us know who you are, how we can pray for you, and if there's more information we can provide you about our church, ways of getting involved, or any additional online resources. We'd love to connect with you throughout the week. We look forward to worshiping with you and hearing from you. And make sure you stick around following the service for a specific benediction for our online community. Fear because
Well, church, surely God is our salvation. We will trust and not be afraid. Let's stand together as we pray. Holy Spirit, your nearness is our good. Shape our way of paying attention today so that we can see the world as you see it. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit that we pray. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the kingdom of God and what it means for us to be sort of bound to each other, to work for each other's good, to receive each other despite our differences. And one of our simplest ways of starting to practice that in our community is passing the peace, to turn to someone next to you in the pew and to say, the peace of Christ be with you. It's, uh, in doing so, we sort of mirror God's way of receiving all of us. And so I'm gonna invite you this morning in a COVID safe way to turn and to pass the peace of Christ in your pews.
to the very world that he created. But the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him, but all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. And they're reborn with a birth that comes from God. And so the word became human and made his home among us. And he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Let's continue responding to Jesus Christ this morning.
be seated. Each month we take time to hear about how God is moving in and through the various ministries at College Wesleyan Church. And so I wanna invite Pastor Tim Woody to come forward and share how God is working in hospitality and Discover CWC. Yeah, it's a privilege uh, to oversee connections and special needs. Uh, but the one thing that I kind of keep in mind is that it's easy to forget what it's like uh, first time attending in person or joining us online. There's a lot of things that you can experience. It, it can feel isolating, confusing, uh, awkward, embarrassing even to come to a church and be a little bit newer. Uh, and you can actually be coming here and joining us for months, years without tapping into all God has in store for you. Uh, so one of the pathways uh, in order to get a little bit deeper connected here is through Discover CWC. And Discover CWC is a five-week guided kind of a small gathering of people who are maybe a little bit newer or they're just looking to get a little bit more connected. And I, this is also available to those of us online too. Uh, and if it's something that you are interested in or you want a little bit more information about, just outside these doors, there's a booth, and uh, you can get connected that way, or you can visit our webpage at collegewest.com slash discovercwc. Now, I, I know before all of us make a mad dash to go to that booth or go online real quick, uh, let's hear from a few people who have gone through it this past year. I decided to go through Discover CWC so that I could feel like more of a part of the church. I wanted to belong here at College West and being a freshman, I didn't really know anybody and I didn't really feel like I knew what this church was about and that kind of thing. So the class helped me to get more of a background on this place that I didn't really know. I mean, I've gone to this church for my entire life since I was like three years old, I think. And um, as the, I've always planned on becoming like a member of the church. And as the years have gone on, I've gotten more and more involved through like the youth group and things like that. It just seemed like the like logical next step and a good opportunity to get to like learn more about the church that maybe I hadn't heard before. And then also uh, just to start those steps towards membership through that. It didn't take us long to realize that this was the church we wanted to attend. The preaching, the worship, the people all drew us in. And so once we decided this was our church, then we wanted to know more about it. I have a better understanding of like what College West's uh, like mission statement is, like making more and better disciples, they say, which I had heard that before, but like actually getting to hear it explained and understand how they're trying to develop like the community with within College West and then also the community outside of College West, like in the greater area of Marion. Like, I had a better understanding of what that meant and what College West was really trying to do through that. You know, one thing that um, College Westing does is, you know, they make disciples, send them out in the community. Now that more of them are a member, I feel like more I'm becoming more of a disciple for this church. And, you know, when I do, um, I'm doing with the public every day, you know, running a boxing club. So it makes me, it makes me want to study more, be a more servant for Christ. I think there's like a few more people that I see in church and I'm like, oh, hi, and they know my name and usually I know their name. <laughs> and so that's good to, to see more people and know more people. That really helps me to feel less alone in like a new stage of life. There's people that, that care about the fact that I came to church and they want to say hi to me. So that's really good. It's called Discover CWC. And that's what we did. We learned about the ministries, we learned about the people, we uh, learned ways that we could be involved, we uh, had a good time doing it, engaged in delightful conversations, met wonderful people. That's exactly what we thought it would be and that's what it was. Holy Spirit, we're pretty in awe of the ways that you've built your church here. Uh, some of us came to this church first when we were in seasons of celebration. Others of us first belonged here when we were just about ready to give up on the church altogether. But whatever our reason for first attending here, your Holy Spirit is the reason that we've stayed. In a thousand quiet ways, 
we have been drawn through this body of believers into a story that's older than us and bigger than us and more inclusive than us. And so we thank you for your story and we thank you for those who have walked the path before us. And even when community just is really difficult, we thank you for each other. At the center of our minds this morning are those who need healing. And so we lift to you Elaine Newton, Gary Brake, and Suzanne Vardaman. And we ask that you'd be near to them and to restore them. We think too of the people that you've planted in our lives that we haven't really seen yet. There are people right near us in our daily routines who haven't yet gathered at our table, whose stories we do not yet know. Help us to really see them this week and enlarge our souls so that we can receive them as you would. As our neighbors expose our frailties and our flaws, give us the humility to receive even those people who lead us into places we haven't been before. And as we hear your word, Lord, may you increase our obedience to it. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit that we pray. Amen. Each week we talk about ways that we can lean in with our time and our talent and our treasure to the things that God's doing here. And you have a chance to give either in the offering stations in the back or online, but you also can find out there about ways to get involved. So if you're interested in finding more connection, as Tim said, there are people out in the atrium who'd love to talk to you, or you can find opportunities online. Thanks so much for the ways that you lean in with all you are to the conversation that God is having here. One day a man walked up to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what is written in the sacred text? And how do you read it? One of the blessings we have at College Church is that God has put around us people who know both what is written and they know how to read it. One of those people in my life is Dr. Chris Bounds. Chris's love for the Word of God and his knowledge in theology provide the perfect lens through which he reads and preaches the Word to the people of God. Dr. Bounds is the dean at the School of Theology and Ministry at Indiana Wesleyan University. He is a scholar, he is a teacher, he's a writer, an ordained minister. Most of all, he is a friend and a mentor to so many of us. This message that he brings to us today on what it really means to love Jesus excites me because I know that it comes out of Chris's own experience, his own journey with Jesus. Dr. Bounds, our love and prayers are with you as you come this morning and bring the word of God that is fresh, always deep and practical and present it to our lives. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him. It doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you and you will later, or later he will be in you. No, I will not leave you as orphans but I will come to you soon. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me, and because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. If I remain in you, you will remain in me. Your life will sustain me. Holy Spirit will change me day by day. disciples said to them, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, 
all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. And I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. If I remain in you, you will remain in me. Your life will sustain me. I am always humbled when I have an opportunity to uh, preach or to share here at College Church. I realize that when we gather gather together here in this sanctuary, that we are on holy ground. And I recognize that and am humbled by it. I invite you now, if you would join with me, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Allow the words of my mouth... And the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I grew up in the 1980s. I graduated from high school in Arkansas in 1984. I finished college in Kentucky in 1988. I love the 80s. It has the greatest movies, and it has the best music. One of the most famous singers, one of the greatest performers in the 1980s was a woman named Tina Turner. Her number one hit, What's Love Got to Do With It? This morning, as we begin today's message, I want to raise the question That Tina Turner asked, what's love got to do with it? Answer, love has everything to do with it. At the very heart of God is love. At the center of the eternal relationships that exist between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is love. At the very heart of of the body of Christ, the church, is love. We love God with our entire being. We love our sisters and our brothers in Christ like Jesus loves. And we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. As Salvation Army theologian and good friend Bill Urey says, love is ultimate reality. But love happens to be one of these words that we throw around in the church. We often speak and say the word love. But very rarely do we ever explain or define what we mean by love. So more specifically this morning, I want to ask the question, what is love? I would imagine if I met with you one-on-one, a number of you would direct me to Scripture and you would point out 1 Corinthians 13, that great 
chapter on love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. But I would say to you, 1 Corinthians 13 shows us what love does, but it does not tell us what love is. Some of you have read C.S. Lewis's famous work on the four loves. Others of you know that in the Greek language, the original uh, language of the New Testament, that the Greeks had four words for love. And so you might talk to me about storge, you might talk to me about philia, you might talk to me about eros, and you might throw out to me that Greek word that we all know that describes God's love for us, agape. But I would say to you that that still doesn't tell us what love is. This morning, I want to give to you a biblical and theological definition of love. Love is composed of two parts. The first part is desire. Love is the desire for union with someone or something. If you love someone, you desire something You desire some sort of fellowship, some sort of relationship with it. Love is a desire for unionness or oneness. But it's not just desire alone. It is also then the alignment of our will with that desire. It's making decisions and choices that actually bring about union. So it's not desire alone. It's not will alone. But what love is, is desire and will bringing about union. Let me try to illustrate this. If I told you this morning that I love Butterfinger candy bars, what would I be saying to you? What I would be saying to you is that I desire oneness. I desire union. I desire intimate fellowship with Butterfinger candy bars. But if I tell you that I love Butterfinger candy bars, I am telling you not only that I desire it, because if all I did was desire it and didn't act on it, didn't align my will with it, didn't make a choice to go to the store and buy a Butterfinger candy bar, take it home, unwrap it, and eat it, it would not be love. Love is desire and will bringing about union. If I told you that I love the University of Notre Dame fighting Irish football team, what am I saying to you? What I'm saying is is that I have some desire for union or fellowship or oneness and whatever degree is possible for me given where I am and who I am in life. I desire some sort of relationship with that team. Desire. But it also would mean that I would go and buy some Notre Dame paraphernalia. It means that I would go and buy Notre Dame merchandise. I would spend some time on Saturday afternoon or Sunday evening watching Notre Dame, or at least bare minimal, I would check on the score on Sunday morning to see who won their football game. It's not desire alone. It's not will alone. But it's desire and will bringing about union. If I tell you that I love my wife and children What am I saying to you? I'm saying that I desire a relationship with them. But if all I did was desire a relationship with them and didn't act on it, didn't make decisions and choices in life to bring about union, which is the essence 
of love, then I would not love my wife and children. Let me pause just a moment. Over the years as a pastor, I have met with couples who are struggling in their relationship. And as they come and they talk to me, it's obvious that they have a desire for each other. The desire is there. But they continue to make decisions and choices that take them away from that union. Please hear me. They do not have love. At best, it is only partial love. But it is not full. It is not complete love. All right, this sets us up for the scriptures. You will remember in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus says to his disciples, love your enemies. What is it to love enemy? Well, first of all, it is to come to a place in life where we desire, please hear me, we desire reconciliation with our enemy. And not only do we desire reconciliation, desire, but then we begin to actively work towards reconciliation. Not desire alone, not will alone, but desire and will working towards union. This brings us to the most famous verse in all of Scripture. You all know it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world... God so desired union and fellowship with the world. But what got in the way of that union, that fellowship? Sin got in the way. But God so desired union that he aligned his will with that desire. He acted to bring about union even in the midst of sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that this sort of biblical and theological definition of love that I've given to you is some sort of syrupy, sappy sentimentality. But I want to be clear this morning that the nature of love does not settle for anything less than true and full union. And if it does not settle for anything less than true and full union, then it will work to overcome any obstacle, any barrier, anything that would get in the way of that union which is the essence of love. A number of years ago when I was pastoring in Searcy, Arkansas, I had a young man who had given his life to the Lord. He came into my office. His name was Brian. And Brian had just started following the Lord, had been a Christian for about five months. I had the privilege of baptizing him. But he came into my office because he had a spiritual problem. His spiritual problem was he hated his father. As a matter of fact, he said to me, he said, Brother Chris, the greatest joy that I have in life is thinking about my father burning eternity in hell. Burning for eternity. Now, I will say this, Brian, you're right. Uh, You have a spiritual problem here. (laughs) Brian's father was an alcoholic and someone who had not just verbally abused him, but physically abused him as he was growing up in the home. And he hated his father. And he realized as a Christian That was not good. And what was interesting is that as we began to work with Brian, you could see that the Lord began to transform his desires so that he began to desire reconciliation and oneness with his father. 
And then not only that, Brian then began to align his will with that desire. We met together in my office, Brian and his father. And in the midst of that conversation, this father was unwilling to recognize that he had done anything wrong in his relationship with Brian. There was nothing wrong with how he had physically and verbally abused him growing up. Now, I want to ask you this question. Is it possible for true union, true restoration of relationship to take place as long as that father is unwilling to confess and to repent of what he had done to Brian? Sometimes we have trouble reconciling love with holiness. Do you want to know at least a great part of what holiness is? Holiness is what love requires for union. Holiness is what greases the skid. It is what allows an adhesive to take place in the relationship of love. Let me try to illustrate that with you this morning. I can tell you this morning that I love you. I love you to the degree to which I am capable of loving you given the circumstances of our relationships. Some of you I know better than others. And so I have a different relationship of love with you. But I can say to you this morning, do I earnestly desire union and fellowship with you to the degree to which I am capable of doing? Absolutely. But it's not just desire alone, but it is also will alone. It's also will as well. That I make decisions and choices that facilitate that union. How many of you realize That if I'm truly going to love you to the degree to which I am capable of loving, given the circumstances of our lives, that it requires you, me, to treat you in respectful ways. It requires me to work to your flourishing and not to your detriment. Do I hear an amen? That's what holiness is. Holiness is what love requires for there to be union. Please hear me. Love is not being a doormat. Love is not something that enables people in their self-destructive behavior. Love seeks to overcome all barriers, all obstacles that keep us from having that fullness of union, which is love. All of this to set us up for this passage of Scripture that we have this morning. In this passage that was read to you, Jesus says not just once, not twice, not three times, but four times Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. He says it first of all in verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Verse 21. Whoever has my commands and obey them, he is the one who loves me. Verse 23. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And then in verse 24, he states the same teaching by way of negation. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Jesus is saying this. If you desire union, fellowship, oneness with Christ, if you desire to walk with Christ, then you must align your will With his. 
If we do not align our will with His will, then there is rupture in relationship. There is separation in relationship. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You will keep my commands. My sisters and brothers, because of the fall, because of original sin, because of the disobedience of the first parents in the Garden of Eden, because of inherited depravity, I will tell you the love of Jesus does not come naturally to us and does not come easily to us. And if you and I are going to be set free to love Jesus, then God has to address the problem of desire and the problem of will. Because the truth of the matter is, as a result of the fall, you and I neither really desire union with Christ, nor are we able to align our will to bring about that union. First is the problem of desire. Martin Luther, the great reformer, helps us to understand the problem of the fall. Luther said, as a result of original sin, that you and I come into this life in such a way, hear this vivid language. We wickedly, curvedly, viciously seek all things, even God, for our own sake. Luther's point is this. The fall doesn't bring atheism into our lives, although it can. What the fall does is that it may allow us to acknowledge God. It may allow us to worship God. It may allow us to serve God. And please hear me. The fall can even empower us to lay down our lives for God. But here's the kicker. For our own sake. Luther's point is this. That we pursue God, not as an end in and of itself, but we pursue God as a means to achieve and realize what we ultimately love in life. God simply becomes a means and not an end. There's a story told in the history of Christianity. It's not found in the scriptures. But it's one of these stories that you say to yourself, it could be true. The story goes like this. Jesus was with his disciples one morning. And at the very beginning of the day, he tells his disciples to scatter and find a rock that they will carry throughout the day. And so the disciples scatter looking for just the right rock that they will carry through the day. Some get larger rocks, some get smaller rocks. Peter, though, wanting to obey the letter of Jesus' command, if not the Spirit, begins to find the smallest rock he can find. And he finds a pebble. He picks up that pebble, and throughout the day, he's patting himself on the back for his wisdom especially as he's seen other disciples who are struggling to carry their larger rocks. That evening, Jesus and the disciples make camp, and around the fire, the disciples gather. And at a certain point in the evening, Jesus snaps his finger, and the rocks turn in 
to bread. Poor Peter. Didn't even have a morsel of bread that evening. And he goes to bread, I mean, he goes to bed, not only angry, but very hungry. The next day, Jesus gives the same command. Find a rock that you will carry throughout the day. The disciples scatter. This time, Peter finds the largest rock that he can carry. And so as he's going through the day carrying his large rock with great difficulty, with great struggle, the only thing that keeps him going is that he will finally have his belly filled at the end of the evening. Well, they come to the place where they spend the night. They're gathered around the fire. And this time, Jesus doesn't snap his finger. He does not turn the rock into bread. And Peter has had all he can take. And so in anger, he unloads on Jesus. And Jesus simply turns to him and asks, Peter, were you carrying that rock for me? Or were you carrying that rock for you? My sisters and brothers, this is our problem. We're willing to serve Jesus as long as Jesus gives to us what we ultimately love. That love can be fame. That love can be fortune. That love can be recognition. That love can be self-fulfillment. That love can be the desire to be loved by others, to be accepted by others. But we use God as a means to that ultimate love and not an end in and of itself. My sisters and brothers, I want to ask you this morning, what do you desire? What do you long for? Do you desire nothing more in this life than union and fellowship with Jesus? Or is Jesus simply a means to something that you love and desire more? Whatever else it is to be born again, whatever else it is to be spiritually regenerated, it is to have a transformation of our desires so that our love of Jesus is the end of our lives and not the means to something more or beyond. We love him above all else. That is the problem of desire. We must come to a place, if we're truly going to love Jesus, that he is the ultimate end. For everything that we say and do in any other love that we may have in life. But there is a second problem because love isn't just the desire, but it is also the will. The alignment of the will with that desire. I don't know if you've ever experienced this in life, but it is a miserable life. It is a horrible existence to desire union with Christ above all else and not be able to align your will with that desire. This is what's described so vividly in Romans chapter 7. The good that I want to do, I desire to do. I am unable to do that which I do not want to do. I find myself doing. 
The problem of the fall is that even when there's a transformation of our desire, we struggle aligning our will with that desire. A number of years ago, this now, I was trying to think about it this morning, I think it was six years ago, I found myself in Edinburgh, Scotland, and I was hiking outside of the city. And I came, as, as on this path, I came to a stone wall. And the path led to some steps that went to the top of the wall, and then there were steps on the other side that you went down. But I came to this wall, and for some reason or another, this idea entered my mind. Chris, why don't you just jump over the wall? Why don't you just jump over it? It'd been a while since I'd had a nice challenge like that. And so I did. I backed up. I knew I couldn't do it standing still. And so I began running towards the wall, and I jumped as high as I could. And I knew in the moment that as soon as I left the ground, I was not going to clear the wall. And sure enough, my uh, legs hit the very top of the wall and I tumbled over to the other side. And being a good American, what was the first thing that I did? I looked up to see if anybody saw what happened. <laughs> and lo and behold, as fate would have it, or maybe God in his providence had it, there was a group of young people that were heading on the other side and they saw everything that had taken place. They immediately ran to me to see if I was all right. I have to tell you this, it's the first time that it happened in my life, it's happened since then. But as uh, they were helping me and making sure I was all right, God bless them for that. Uh, a couple of them in the back, I heard them say this. What was that old man thinking? <laughs> what was that old man thinking? I wanted to jump over that wall, to recover the days of my youth. I gave it my very best shot. And I failed. Many of you know what it is to have a desire to follow Jesus walk in obedience to him, to truly love him and not have the strength of will to walk in obedience. There may be those areas of your life in which those, that obedience comes fairly easily, but for most of us, there are strongholds in our lives that keep us enslaved. And keep us from being able to truly align our will with Christ's will. But Jesus in this passage of scripture has good news. And Jesus said this. He's speaking of the spirit of truth. Who said that the world, this is verse 17, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. Here's what Jesus says. For he lives with you and will be in you. Verse 26, speaking of the Spirit, but the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Please hear me. Jesus isn't just talking about intellectually reminding us of everything that he has taught, but he said when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that he will in fact empower you to walk in what you know of him. To walk in what you know of Christ. We know that this giving of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is talking about is going to take place on the day of Pentecost in which the Holy Spirit will not only be with them, but the Holy Spirit will be in them. And it is not by accident that the Spirit of God falls into the disciples on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is a Jewish festival that celebrates 50 days, hence the word penta. 50 days after the deliverance of the children of Israel 
and the Passover feast in Egypt. 50 days afterwards, God gave to Israel the law on Mount Sinai. And Pentecost celebrates the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. But you will remember that the Israelites, even when they wanted to obey the law, they could not obey it. And the prophets then, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, prophesied of a day in which the Messiah would come. And what will the Messiah do? He will give the Spirit who will take the law that is written on tablets of stone and write them upon the heart. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27 says, That when the Spirit comes, He will write the law upon our hearts. Many of you know Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit. And you will notice that that is singular, it's not plural. It doesn't say fruits of the Spirit, it says the fruit of the Spirit. And you will notice what is the very first thing that is said. The fruit, the one fruit of the Spirit is, it's love. And I want you to know joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control is all that comprises of love. The Spirit gives to us everything necessary for us to love Jesus. There is a work of grace that is unleashed by Jesus Christ in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that enables us to not only desire Jesus above all else in life, but enables us to align our will so that desire and will come together in such a way That anything that comes into life that would disrupt or break or interrupt that, it will work to overcome and address. My sisters and brothers, that is good news. You can desire Jesus above all else. And you can be empowered through the Spirit to align your will with Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we respond to God this morning, we're going to sing a song together, and I hope that gives you language to respond in a way that is powerful and formative. But as I was listening to Dr. Bounds in first service, I thought about all the ways in the last, or all the times in the last uh, 10 years I've sat in these pews and I've come to this altar and prayed that God would change me prayed that God would continue to transform my desires or surrendered certain things that weren't fully in alignment with what I believed to be in the will of Christ. And so this morning, as we stand and sing, if you want to come forward to the altar and pray, there are brothers and sisters in this room that I'm sure would pray alongside you as they've done for me and Daniel and others in this church. Let's stand and sing to our God together.
gather together at the table. So if you're coming here, prepare your hearts. And if you're joining us at home, prepare your own table. Now, church, hear the benediction. May you, being rooted and established in love, have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge so you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. May the Spirit empower you, church, to take on the desires and the will of Christ so you experience union with God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, you're sent. Amen. We're so glad you joined us this week to worship God with your online community. Don't forget to fill out the online connect card so we can keep in touch throughout the week. And as you reflect on the questions from the worship resource page on our website, may you integrate it into the rest of your week and with the people you regularly encounter. Peace to you as you go with Christ.